You are welcome to submit questions throughout the program by using the Q&A feature provided by WebEx, and at the end of the program, with time permitting, the speakers will address your question. You are also welcome to submit questions directly to the presenters following the webinar, and contact information will be displayed at the end of the presentation. In approximately, two, uh, in approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green and Harris Fletcher and Granis will communicate the availability of the webinar recording and access to the PowerPoint materials. We are pleased to have four fantastic speakers today from Epstein Becker Green and Harris Fletcher and Granis. However, let me first introduce our moderator, Robert Jaron, who we are pleased to have join us today. Mr. Jaron is Senior Director of Government Affairs at Qualcomm. At this time, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Robert Jaron. Thank you, Whitney. Mobile technology is the largest platform in history, and healthcare at some point affects everybody. Wireless health technologies are increasingly being used to personalize healthcare. Over the past five years, mobile health space has quite simply skyrocketed. As a result, so has the debate and opinions over policy, regulatory, and legal issues. Joining me today to discuss wireless health regulatory issues are four distinguished attorneys, including Kim Terrell Knott, a member of the firm Epstein Becker Green, Paul Margie, a partner with Harris, Wilshire, and Granis, Adam Salander, a member of the firm Epstein, Becker, and Green, and Adrian Fowler, an associate of Harris, Wilshire, and Granis. Our four issue areas include FDA regulation of mobile health and health IT software, FCC communications regulations and equipment authorization of converged devices, cybersecurity considerations for wireless health, and lastly, HIPAA privacy regulation. Starting us off will be Kim Terrell Knott, Kim, you have the floor. Great, thanks, Sharon. So we can skip down um, to the next slide here, and I'll just walk through the agenda quickly. Um, FDA has been fairly busy, so I do want to touch on um, you know, their overall regulation of software, what's regulated, what's not, what's subject to uh, their enforcement discretion policy, and then uh, dive into a little bit more detail on three recent guidance documents that have been issued uh, relating to MDDS, which is the Medical Device Data System Regulation, uh, Wellness, and then Accessory. Um, and then lastly, discuss clinical decision support um, and give you an overview of what we know today and uh, what we expect next. So um, with that, why don't we move down to the next slide. And you can advance to the next substantive slide there. So the, from a, a one up, Whitney, sorry about that. Um, from a thematic perspective, I think this, this slide captures what we've been seeing over the past, I would say two plus years, you know, two to three years um, from FDA. It's really a changing landscape highly dynamic, um, a lot of, and that's driven by a lot of the innovation in the industry. Um, and FDA's been responding to that with a number of different policies and really taking a bit of a deregulatory approach with respect to how it's handling um, many of these health IT and mobile, mobile uh, applications. So if we skip down to the next slide, I just want to highlight some of the uh, primary primary guidance documents that have come out. So I would say over the past, you know, 2014, 2015, um, even in just the few weeks that we've been in 2015, we've seen quite a bit of activity. Um, and what FDA has really been focusing on is taking a risk-based approach. Um, that, that has always been their policy and always been their approach, but I think it's really been demonstrated um, significantly in some of the recent, um, some of their recent guidance and policies that they've issued. So um, just highlighting here, you know, the mobile medical app guidance, which came out about almost two years ago now, um, really, they really um, articulated a framework which is risk-based. So really focusing their enforcement activities on the higher risk mobile apps. Um, and to the right of the slide, you can see this triangle is symbolic of, um, of how they've approached mobile medical apps. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the examples um, on the next slide, but to give you an overview, they really divided um, the technology 
into three categories, those which are unregulated, those which are maybe, you know, they may possibly meet the definition of medical device, but they're so low risk uh, that the agency is not focusing its um, enforcement resources on, the, on that category of products. And then the higher risk apps, um, sort of at the top of the, top of the triangle there is where FDA will focus their enforcement activities. Um, and so consistent with that, they've issued a number of other um, policies. It was a FIDESIA report, which is a, uh, discussed briefly later in the presentation, but it's a, a joint report issued with FCC, FDA, and ONC, really articulating a comprehensive proposal on how to regulate all health IT um, among the three different agencies uh, or organizations and articulating where the different um, roles and responsibilities of each organization is. And they, in that report, at this stage it's just a proposal, but in that report they, um, they outline a similar framework which is risk-based, uh, similar to the framework which was articulated in the Global Medical Ops Guidance. And um, since, the, since the today's report, there's been a few other, there's been a few other um, guidances that have come out. The MDDS guidance, um, which was proposed back in June and just finalized just a few weeks ago, places mobile medical app, um, excuse me, me, medical device data systems into enforcement discretion. So this had been previously regulated and now the agency is recognizing that it's lower risk and um, will not be subject to, um, not be subject to active regulation. Um, and then there's a few other um, policies here which I will get into in more detail um, in the presentation. So if we want to move down to the next slide, Whitney. So what does get regulated? And again, taking that, um, taking that risk-based approach, on the left-hand side, where I have a couple of examples there in terms of what is not regulated. The key to that, to that column is really that these products do not meet the definition of a medical device, meaning that they, do, they are not intended to be used in connection with the diagnosis, treatment, cure, mitigation, or prevention of a disease or condition. So when you look at the examples, they're really talking about general use products, general educational information, administrative products, things that um, are not intended to be used for diagnostic or treatment purposes. Um, I have highlighted at the bottom there health and wellness, um, and I have a, an asterisk because I will talk about that some more. Um, it, it can't, that category could fall within unregulated or enforcement discretion, but we'll discuss that in more detail in the coming slides. So in the middle category is this enforcement discretion category, and as I mentioned on the prior slide, the focus here is really those products that are low risk. Um, they, they may be intended to be used in the diagnosis, cure, or treatment, mitigation, prevention of a disease or condition, but they're low risk. And so we have a number of examples here, EHRs and patient portals, um, various trending and tracking applications which allow individuals or patients to track their health data and even communicate and share that with their providers. Um, or allow, or various applications that help patients, um, support, you know, it supports patients in their daily environment, helping them to manage their disease or condition. Um, it's not recommending treatments, it's not uh, changing treatments, but it's more um, facilitating or encouraging certain behaviors um, in their daily environment. And then a couple other examples here, medication reminders um, were previously regulated, in fact, but have been moved into enforcement discretion under recent guidance. Um, and we'll talk in more detail about low-risk CDS products and uh, medical device data systems in the coming slide. And then the last category here on the right-hand side are those which are regulated. And again, applying the risk-based framework, these products are, they meet the definition of a medical device um, and they either act as accessories to a medical device, which um, 
we'll discuss also further down with respect to some of the new guidance, but there it's devices which are controlling another device or somehow aug augmenting or supplementing another device. Analyze patient-specific data, which falls within the category of CDS, or they transform a platform or device into a medical device, so it's, it's actually functioning um, to a large extent like a medical device. And some of you may be familiar with attachments which can be uh, put onto your mobile phone and allow you to capture your EKG reading or what have you. That's an example of something that would transform a phone into a medical device and be regulated uh, because it's, it's functioning in the same way as a standalone medical device would. So if we go down to the next slide, I'll, go, I'll get into a little bit more detail. And this is where I'm moving into some of the recent guidance that's come out. Um, and again, this is just a couple weeks ago. FDA finalized its guidance with respect to med uh, medical device data systems. Now, what's interesting here is um, just a few years ago, MDDS was actually considered class three medical device. It was then downclassified to a class one, which is the lowest risk category. And now, just a few weeks ago, FDA has moved it from class one into the enforcement discretion category. What's important to understand about medical device data systems is that they have very limited functionality. So they can store medical device data, they can transfer medical device data, they can display it, and they can also do limited conversion. Um, and that, that's key because if you look at the bottom of the slide here, they cannot modify medical device data or analyze medical device data. Um, and that's an important characteristic to understand when you're assessing whether something falls within MDDS and therefore is not actively regulated. The other, the other two caveats with, uh, with MDDS is that it cannot be involved in active patient monitoring. And what FDA means by that is it can't be used to support uh, immediate clinical action uh, based upon the data. And then the last, um, the last caveat there is that it can't be used to control a device. Um, and that, that ties a bit into the accessory discussion that we'll be having in the coming slides. So if we move down, Whitney, to the next slide, I'll discuss um, some other recent guidance, the wellness draft guidance. Now this is draft guidance, it hasn't been finalized yet, it's still open to comment, um, but it was released in the middle of January. And what the wellness guidance is, is describing, in this world of mobile technologies, there's so much data and so much opportunity for folks, consumers, patients to use data to help improve their lifestyle, help improve their health. And in, in some regards, that may not be regulated by FDA. In other regards, there's also um, a significant body of knowledge and it's becoming well understood um, by clinicians and lay, lay users that improving your healthy lifestyle choices can actually have great benefit to chronic conditions or certain diseases. And it's been a real challenge for the industry as these technologies have become more commonplace to understand at what point does a product that helps individuals live a healthier lifestyle, at what point would that be considered uh, a device because it's treating a disease? And so FDA uh, just released this draft guidance and essentially how the guidance works is the agency um, is proposing that products that are intended for general wellness use and they are inherently low risk to the patient would be subject to enforcement discretion. And how they're defining um, wellness, and this is, this is key getting back to the point that I was making earlier, they're, they're defining wellness as, you know, if a product is, is only intended to encourage healthy lifestyle, healthy activity, you know, in that instance, I think of Fitbit or something, a pedometer, something that's helping you track, um, track your, your activity or your physical activity. That's just general wellness. But they went, on, they went one step further and said, 
Now, if it's still general wellness, or we would still consider it falling into general wellness, if you, if there is well recognized and well established scientific evidence that that healthy lifestyle has a benefit, it reduces the risk or it reduces the impact of a chronic disease. That too would be considered general wellness. Um, but but there's a there's a there's a nuanced application of that. And, and if we go down to the next slide, I'll walk through a bit of the decision tree, and then uh, we can get into some examples. So um, this this is a decision tree I've put together. It's not necessarily FDA uh, guidance material here, but um, essentially walking through these different questions. So is it only general wellness claims? Think Fitbit. Um, if the answer is yes, then um, you know you can you ask the question: Does it involve? Does, do the claims relate or involve a disease or condition? Um, if they do reference a disease or condition, it needs to be clear that the health that it's only the healthy lifestyle impact is well understood. So examples would be: you know, Exercise is going to you know, it helps um, patients with high blood pressure, or a healthy diet helps. Patients live. Patients with diabetes live a healthier, healthier life, or limits the impact of the disease. So, if that's well understood, then you want to make sure going down to the next level in the decision tree is that we're just talking about reducing the risk or living healthy with that with that specific disease. And then, lastly, is there any kind of inherent patient safety risk? So, here the guidance refers to things that are implantable or um, have radiation or laser, you know, higher, higher risk type um, functionality with the product. Um, and if you flow through, if you flow through all of those questions answering yes and there is not a pa an inherent patient safety risk, you're going to fall within that general wellness category. And it would be subject, and then your product would be subject to enforcement discretion and not actively regulated. So if we go down to the next slide, I won't walk through each one of these examples um, because you will you will have an opportunity to receive these slides. But um, but the what I wanted to explain is just how the how the application of the guidance applies to. Um, the the issuing of claims. So general wellness claims can promote and maintain. You know, we'll just use the first one as an example. You can, claims to promote or maintain a healthy weight, encourage healthy living, assist assisting someone with weight loss goals. You can a manufacturer could make those claims, and they could make those claims at, um, in connection with promoting to a diabetic patient. But they can't make the claim that their app themselves either um, reduces the risk or cures diabetes or treats diabetes or improves the diabetic outcomes. What improves the outcome is the actual healthy lifestyle. So it's almost like a two-step approach where the app can be promoted as helping you maintain that healthy lifestyle. And then it's the healthy lifestyle that there's well-established scientific evidence that healthy lifestyle helps reduce the impact or re, uh, risk of diabetes, but the app itself is not is not making that diagnostic or treatment or improved outcomes type claim. Um, so it's a bit of a nuanced. I, you know, the way I think about it is a two-step approach, um, and there's some examples here, and more in the guidance. So I, I would encourage folks to take a look at the guidance. So why don't we move down to the to the next slide, Whitney, and move into the discussion around accessories. Now, I'll give a little bit of background to what the issue is with accessories um, before I dive into the, the guidance. So in the connected health world, I mean, the, action, the benefit or the, the huge benefit and the intent of these systems is that you're able to share data across multiple systems and things are interconnected. And when you when you look at FDA's traditional treatment of products that have been connected to medical devices, 
um, there's, there's a risk or there's the, commonly those are considered accessories. And what the impact from an FDA perspective is that if a product is considered, or traditionally, if a product is considered an accessory to another device, that product automatically takes on the classification of the device. So what, we're, what we have seen in the connected health, mobile health space is that there was a significant amount of auto upregulation of really low risk products. So if you think about um, something that might serve as a secondary display, I think is probably the easiest example, that would, of medical device data, that could be bumped up to a, to a higher risk, um, to, a, to a higher risk category. Now, there's a caveat there um, technically with the MDDS rule, but there, but there are other examples where you have a really low risk um, accessory or a plug or USB cord, and if it's attaching to a class two or class three device, it will be regulated at that class two or class three level. So the, what the accessory guidance uh, did, and is, it, it is draft, so the agency is looking for uh, comments at this stage. But the accessory guidance is it defined what an accessory is. It had not yet, it had not previously been formally defined. So it defined what an accessory is, that it's a device that's intended to support, supplement, or augment the performance of a parent device. Um, and it then laid out the framework for how it would regulate accessories. And essentially, it said, listen, instead of auto upregulating, we're gonna look at the risk profile of the accessory in and of itself. We're gonna regulate the accessory in and of itself. They will consider the impact on the parent device, but there's not gonna be that automatic upregulation to the parent device uh, classification. And um, and the and where this framework I think has been welcomed by industry, where the agency stopped short is actually coming out with a number of um, classifications for well, you know, commonly used accessory in this space. So what manufacturers will need to do in order to um, have an accessory separately classified is either go through a reclassification process or go through a de novo process, which um, takes time, effort, and, and money from a manufacturer perspective, um, but it is, there is a pathway now to have accessories um, regulated based upon its own risk and not the risk of a parent device, which I think is a, a step in the right direction from a, um, from a policy perspective. If we go down to the next slide, I can um, give you, this is a good case study, actually, w um, in terms of applying the new guidance. So the guidance, the draft guidance came out mid-January, and very shortly thereafter, the Dexcom share, um, share direct secondary display was, was um, cleared. Now, what's interesting is, is this is significant in a, few, in a couple different ways. One is that it's focusing on diabetes, which historically has been considered a, you know, a, a high risk, um, you know, it's a, it's a high risk disease state, and the agency has taken a somewhat conservative um, approach to devices in this area uh, traditionally. And then the second is, is that this, the, this is gathering and using and displaying CGM data, so continuous glucose monitor data, which is a class three device, the highest risk, um, falling in the highest risk category. And the way this was cleared was, well, I'll, I'll run through just some of the significant characteristics of the device. So it's all, it serves as a secondary display of the glucose, the CGM data. It's not the primary, it doesn't replace the primary, and that's an important that's an important um, characteristic. And it's used to be able to notify another person of the CGM data. So if you have a child who has diabetes, this allows the, the parent you're at a distance to receive notifications of their CGM data 
um, it can be received in real time, essentially in real time. Um, it does it does go through the receiver first. It doesn't automatically connect or just connect to the CGM itself. Um, but what's interesting and why this is important is that this went through the de novo process and it was it was cleared as a class two 510k exempt product. And so in the future, you know, historically under the existing or prior model, it most likely would have been considered class three because it was an accessory to a CGM. Now it's class two and it's 510k exempt, meaning that um, manufacturers of devices which fall within this same category and definition do not need to submit a 510k in advance. They do need to follow special controls, um, but that is a significant reduction in the regulatory um, burden for manufacturers. Um, and this is, this is a, a great example of application of the, the draft guidance. Now, I just, on the right-hand side, I do highlight some of the things that it's not intended to do, and those things are gonna be considered higher risk activities. So, it's not making treatment decisions, dosing decisions, it's not calculating the insulin, or modifying the data in any way, controlling the device, and it's not, importantly, it's not replacing either the individual's obligation to self-monitor, but also it's not serving as a, the primary display. Um, it is just a secondary display and secondary notification. So if we go down to the, to the next slide, um, I, I want to hit uh, briefly on CDS. Now, CDS is clinical decision support, um, and we are still awaiting guidance from FDA at this point, now, but we do have some information about CDS. Why don't we skip down to the next slide? and I'll walk through at a high level how CDS is defined. And CDS, um, and this is an informal definition, but it's essentially a product which takes data, it can be any form of data, and it converts it in some way to, um, to have an output of some kind of patient-specific actionable result. Um, very broad definition, and I think that's, um, that's been a bit of a challenge for FDA. If we move down to the next slide, um, I do want to hit the, some of these kind of um, quickly. CDS, you know, similar to how the medical device definition is broad and needs a risk-based approach, CDS is similar. It's a very, very broad definition. And so where the, where the agency has been struggling and industry is, has been requesting for the guidance is how are you defining low-risk CDS, which should be subject to enforcement discretion, versus high-risk CDS, which is, um, which would be subject to regulation. Now, so for, here are a couple of examples with respect to low-risk CDS that we have from the Mobile Medical App Guidance, your access to clinical guidelines or simple calculations. Um, but those are really um, sort of easy examples on the, on the far end of the spectrum in terms of things that are significantly low risk. Uh, why don't we go down to the next slide? And I can walk through, um, here are some examples. Again, this comes from the FIDASIA report, which I mentioned at the beginning of the call. Um, this is not official FDA policy at this point, but it, it'll give you a sense of directionally where they're going. Again, these examples are on either end of the spectrum, you know, high-risk clinical decision support, CAD software used in imaging. So why don't we move down to the next slide and I'll talk through um, some of the traditional factors that FDA has looked at. You know, they, they look at whether the um, user has the necessary skill set to interpret the results of the software, whether the software enables the user to um, adequately accept, uh, assess the output. Is there enough transparency to the software? Is it something that has to happen in real time and doesn't provide the user an opportunity to reflect on the reflect on the output or the analysis, um, as well as some other other um, factors in terms of how novel some of the um, the individual features are. Um, these are all factors that we've observed from an industry perspective as as influencing what FDA has focused on. Um, and we anticipate that a number of these will still, uh, you know, will, will find themselves into the CDS guidance that we're um, anticipating this year. But if we, if we go down to the next slide, there's a couple, there's, a, there's another um, recent, recently re, uh, released 
report that may provide some additional guidance for us um, in terms of how to determine which CDS is low risk CDS and what's high risk CDS. Um, and that's the IMDRF report. The IMDRF is the International Medical Device Regulators Forum. And now again, this too is not FDA policy, but why I mention it is because FDA was involved in drafting um, this policy. And it's really the, the goal of the policy was around trying to harmonize how various regulators around the world view the risk profile of different software products, medical devices. And so what the report focuses on is um, it pulled out two key factors, and, and this is present in, um, in the issues that we were talking, the factors that we were talking about before, but they really whittle it down to two key factors. One is the significance of the information provided by the software on the healthcare decision. So is the software treating or diagnosing? Is it driving clinical management or that next clinical decision, or is it merely informing the clinical decision or the next clinical step? Um, that's sort of one of the factors. The other factor that they look at is the seriousness of the disease. And again, this is getting back to look, looking at it from a risk-based profile. And so here again, they divide it into three categories. Is the disease critical, life-threatening, uh, is it serious, or is it non-serious, more, more, more in the area of a chronic disease or a common cold? Um, and they, they, they lay out, um, you know, a risk matrix based upon these different characteristics. Now, as I said, this is not necessarily FDA policy, but we are anticipating that this would be something that we'll see uh, influencing the CDS guidance uh, that we hope to see this year. So if we go down to the next slide, it's really about what's next. Um, and what we're hoping for, as I've mentioned, is seeing a draft of the CDS, CDS guidance, um, but we also anticipate that you know, the agency, once it receives comments on the accessory rule, as well as the uh, wellness guidance, we'll see final versions of those coming out, um, you know, hopefully later this year, but um, sometimes it can take longer than that to, to wrestle with some of the comments. But, um, that's, there's a lot on the horizon, a lot has, that has happened, and um, we look forward to continuing to monitor those developments. So with that, Thanks. we'll move, we'll thank move you, on. Kim, it's, uh, yeah. yeah, thank you, Kim, it's Jaren. So with that, we'll move on to Paul. Paul Margie, developing an FCC regulatory checklist. Hi, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I, Kim has covered the FDA, I'm gonna cover the FCC. So, and my goal here is to give you a big picture understanding of the aspects of FCC regulation that uh, can impact your companies and, and investments. So, to do that, we're going to have to stay at a relatively high level most of the time, uh, but I'll dive deeper in some places to give you an understanding of how the gears and levers work, um, uh, and happy to dive deeper on any of the topics with you individually, my contact information is at the end of the slides. So, um, so to, to start, um, uh, I, I think the, the role of the FDA in regulating health technologies is better known than the role of the FCC. Um, and I think the trend in the industry, however, is for today's health technologies and services to integrate elements that now are providing a hook for increased FCC uh, attention and, in, in many cases, regulation. And the most important of these is the integration of radios. And so, and these can be Wi-Fi radios, cellular radios, Bluetooth, or the specialized radios that use specialized frequencies that the FCC has set aside for health applications. And so, so one big trend is you've got all these radios and all of these new health devices, and, and, and that's increasingly important for the industry and, and increasingly interesting to the FCC. And in parallel, the FCC has also, more generically, substantially increased its regulation of non-telecommunications companies uh, to cover enterprises and technologies that they haven't regulated in the past. So this is especially true in its um, uh, direct regulation of equipment makers, much more so than a kind of regulatory generation ago. Um, and most recently, it's, it's regulation of what they call over-the-top services, like voice over internet protocol and other internet-based services 
that are offered by companies other than traditional telecom companies. And then even today, as we speak, the FCC is um, in its, uh, making its big network neutrality decision, and as part of that is changing the way that it looks at who is a telecommunications carrier um, so, and who's providing telecommunications services. So these, these three big trends all mean that the universe of those who should be uh, understanding FCC regulation has substantially increased in recent years. Uh, and it's particularly true in the, in the mHealth industry. So, so who should care? You'll see in this slide, um, uh, certainly innovators that are building new technologies. And, and it's not just hardware technologies, but services too uh, uh, can be regulated by the FCC. Investors that are diligencing these companies. So I, 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 I see this a lot in my clients is that someone's coming in and thinking about uh, placing an investment in a company and understanding what restrictions, especially a startup new technology might have uh, from FCC regulations, both in terms of time restrictions and in terms of uh, uh, product design restrictions. And then third, and often overlooked, are transacting parties. And so when you're buying or selling a company with mHealth products, uh, an important part of that diligence is looking at the FCC regulatory situation. I think most people know to do that if you're buying a telecommunications company, but people often don't think of doing that when you're buying a company that depends heavily on, on regulated products by the FCC, and it's an important thing to do. So, and why should these uh, uh, folks care about it? Well, number one is impact on product decisions. So, the FCC has regulations that are based on the type of product you've got and the frequencies that you're, that you're using, and that can have a really important impact on the frequency you use, the power that you're allowed to have, the reliability of your devices, the cost of the devices. Um, uh, what you're calculating in terms of battery life has a lot to do with the power you're allowed to use, your coverage areas, um, uh, the claims that you're making about your products. And then the second one is, is delay or interference on closing a transaction. So if, if you don't build in um, a, an FCC uh, diligence uh, component, then you can get caught with the FCC being a long pole in the tent in a transaction, which, which should never be the case. Um, and then uh, last, if you, if you break one of the rules and the FCC catches you or if one of your, your competitors turns you in, which is often how it happens, uh, these violations can lead to fines, which are, uh, can be big, but more importantly, importation bans or design changes, which can be uh, much worse than the fine itself. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So uh, with that foundation, let's talk about developing a checklist for determining if FCC regulation might have an impact on your product or your, your company or your investment. So as I said in the beginning, this is certainly not complete uh, and you should work to customize your own checklist for your own situation. But, but this represents where I always start uh, when I do this for my clients. And so the, the first thing to look at is frequency. You know, what band are you gonna choose? So the, the band that your product uses um, will uh, tell you what rules are going to apply to your product. And so it's important to look first at that. So what, what interference uh, based on this band must you avoid? Uh, are there other people using that that you have to take account of? What interference do you have to accept? Are you in an unlicensed band or a licensed band? Who are your neighbors? Uh, and that's gonna tell you a lot about your design choices and about what, you're, what you can expect down the line. Uh, do you need a license? Uh, in some of these bands, you have to go and uh, get a license in an auction. In others, you have to get an, uh, a license outside of an auction, but you still need permission from the FCC before you uh, start transmitting. And in others, you, you don't need uh, advanced transmit, uh, permission from the FCC as long as you meet certain rules. Uh, and then once you figure all that out, what are your eligibility, power, and service rules? Um, uh, 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 and and it, making sure not only your engineers, but your regulatory shop understands this is important. So once you do that, then you have to look at your equipment authorization. And this is the way that the FCC um, makes sure that you're uh, uh, following all the rules that I just talked about. So does your product need an FCC uh, equipment authorization? If it's got a radio, the answer is almost certainly yes. And then how do you show compliance with the technical rules? And these technical rules range from things like SAR, which is specific absorption rate, which is the measure of the, the human health impact of the, of the radio, uh, power levels, the directionality of your devices, and then OOBE is out-of-band emission. So, you know, what kind of fences are around the, your spectral neighbors? 
Uh, once you do that, you got to look at labeling and disclosures. Now, labeling and disclosures is uh, is maybe not the sexiest topic in uh, in uh, FCC regulation, which we all know is a sexy topic to begin with. But labeling and disclosures are really important um, because if you uh, don't get them right, then this is how the customs service catches you at the borders when you're trying to bring it in from wherever you made the device. And so you got to get your your logos right. The disclosures uh, and and what uh, what we all call magic words that have to appear either on your product on the packaging or in the user manual. It's just a shame to get those wrong and have your products delayed. And then uh, I also added in here the accessibility rules. And as we'll talk about, the FCC has become much more interested, much more aggressive on accessibility to ensure that devices are available to Americans with disabilities. So um, uh, also note that the FCC and other agencies have funding programs for health technologies. And, uh, and those are, uh, may very well be interesting to you. I hope we can do a separate webinar sometime in the future on, on this, but I'm not going to discuss the FCC's important uh, funding side uh, today. Next slide, please. So let's start with frequency and choice of bands. So if your device has a radio in it, the FCC almost certainly must give you permission to use a particular set of frequencies. So the way the FCC does this is by dividing up the entire radio spectrum into frequency bands and then providing rules for each of those bands. Um, and those rules cover things like who can use the band, what power they have to use, how they gain access to the band, and the interference protections that are related to that band. So here on this first slide on, uh, on this topic, I've included some of the bands that the FCC has established specifically for the use of health-related technologies. So, your engineers are going to take a look at these bands and see if those, the physical characteristics of those frequencies meet their needs. Um, uh, and if so, then you have to ensure that you understand the particular regulations that apply to each. So, so let's take a look at these specific bands. So the first one is the medical device radio telecommunication service, what, uh, what the FCC calls med radio. So this covers implanted and body-worn devices. It's not for all um, uh, health devices, but only for implanted and body-worn devices. It has specific uh, frequencies here that you can see. So it's a low frequency um, uh, uh, band, uh, uh, 400 uh, megahertz. And it has separate rules for implantable and for body-worn devices. So the next one is the medical micropower networks. This is a, a low power network that's also very low frequency in the 400 megahertz band, but it's for functional electronic simulation. So you'll see here that the FCC is done, doing something in the medical side that it really doesn't do very much anymore, which is it creates specific bands for very specific types of products and industries. This is uh, um, against the general tide of the FCC, which is making more and more general use bands. But in the medical side, and almost exclusively in the medical side, they're creating these bands with very specific rules for very specific types of equipment. So here, uh, this is for low-power um, uh, functional electro uh, electric stimulation devices. The next is these M-bands, the medical body area networks, um, and this is for networking of body transmitters as opposed to for the, the, the transmitters themselves. This is a higher frequency um, band, so your engineers, again, may like for the networking side as opposed to for the very small distance uh, uh, transmissions that are needed for things like uh, uh, medical micropower networks then uh, they'll like that higher frequency. And then finally, I've noted the, the wireless medical telemetry service, which is very, very different. Here, this is for the transmission of medical telemetry to a monitoring location. So it may be that you've got a telemetry device on a patient in a hospital, and then you've got a monitoring station um, at the nurse's station on the floor. And this is to transmit between the two of them. So uh, let's go to the next slide. And you'll see here, I've, uh, I'm going to dive into med radio for a moment just to show you um, how the details work. And there are similar details for each of these bands that are different from each other. So once you choose this frequency, then you have to understand what are the restrictions, what are the permissions that you've got for your particular band. So here you've chosen med radio, and your engineers tell you this is the one we really want to use. So first, you'll look at licensing and eligibility. So here it's licensed by rule, which is good, probably, depending on what your, what your, uh, your goal is. You don't have to go and win uh, an FCC auction to get uh, access to this band, and it's not exclusive. So if you're not the first one to the party, you still can have access to this band. Um, uh, but it also means that you're gonna have to share this band with others. So uh, it's limited to implanted and body-worn devices, and so you don't have to share this 
with uh, people that are doing general internet access. You don't have to do this with people who are doing non-medical uh, devices, uh, but you do have to share it with other people that are in your line of business. Then you look at what frequencies are available. Now here it's a, a relatively narrow frequency range and it's subdivided so that you've got a particular range for implantable, a larger range. So for implantable devices, you've got from the 401 to 406 megahertz uh, span. But then for these body-worn devices, the FCC has added in um, uh, these uh, uh, edge bands, these shoulder bands uh, at the edges of this frequency, the larger frequency band for body-worn devices as opposed to implantable. Now next you look at interference. So you're operating here on a secondary non-interference with the primary government user. So the FCC is increasingly uh, requiring new users to share with existing users because we've run out of spectrum. There's no kind of Western frontier uh, uh, that's readily available to us anymore. We can't just create brand new bands where there's no, been no one before. And so they're reusing spectrum by allowing secondary users where there are other users. Now, most often this is government users because in the U.S., the government, compared to any other country in the world, the government is a very large user of spectrum. And here you've got some government users, but that government use was consistent with the use uh, on a secondary basis of med radio. But you've got to protect that primary use. So if the government is operating and they cause interference to you, you have to accept it. Uh, next is power. So here you're going to look and see what can I do with my devices. And they define it very specifically with a maximum EIRP of 25 microwatts. And there's also an emission mask. I won't get into the details of that, but I'm happy to for anybody who wants to. And that just defines uh, how you have to protect your neighbors above and below the particular frequencies that you use. There's also an emission bandwidth that's set here that will be important for your folks that are designing your equipment. And note the sharing uh, that I discussed before. So there's not just sharing with the government users, but there's also sharing with each other. And the FCC has mandated that each of these devices have listen before talk capability. So that means when you turn on the device, it looks to the channel that it wants to use and sees if anybody's there. And if there is somebody there, you go to a channel that's empty. Uh, but you have to design that in at the beginning of the product design uh, 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 process. If you're looking at these rules only after you've decided that this is a great idea, then you might be surprised. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, now, frequency, all, you don't have to choose one of the medically specific frequency bands. And in fact, my guess is that most health uh, specific uh, technologies don't. So many, if not most of these technologies are using bands that are made available for more general use. So, and, and as I said, the general trend of the FCC is to designate bands for general use rather than restricting them to any one technology or service. And so here you've got, um, uh, uh, the unlicensed bands where you put your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth devices. You've got the CMRS bands where you've got your licensed uh, 3G and 4G power devices. Um, and, uh, and then, it, interestingly now, because the FCC is running out of spectrum, you've got bands like the 3.5 gigahertz band, which is a hybrid of licensed and unlicensed. And I'm happy to, to talk to people about that offline if you want to see if that's interesting to you. One other important point, that the FCC allows companies to apply for experimental licenses and it's particularly encouraging the development of test beds for mHealth technologies, where you don't have to get individual licenses for each of your test devices if you're trialing a device. Uh, you can also test these in anechoic chambers prior to FCC authorization, and I'm happy to talk more about those uh, if, if people want to. Next slide, please. So now you've chosen your, uh, your frequency and you know the rules, how do you show to the FCC that you're following the rules. Uh, assuming you didn't buy this at auction, you can just move right to this stage. So how do you get permission? So the FCC has a well-established equipment authorization regime, and it depends, it gives you several options on how to do this. Now, importantly, the FCC used to review all the equipment uh, authorization requests itself, but it doesn't do that anymore because there are so many of them and they're so complex. So it's deputized uh, telecommunications certification bodies. Note that's TCB rather than the TSBs there, um, but the, the telecommunication certification bodies are labs all around the world that have been certified to uh, test devices uh, to the FCC uh, um, uh, 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 rules. And so you go to a TCB and they will know what the rules are and work with you to make sure that you're following them. So devices requiring certification are generally put through uh, uh, lab testing to show compliance. They do things like RF safety, that's the SAR rules I talked about, and the emission limits. 
This can take time and be expensive, so just make sure you're talking to a TCB early in the process so you know how much time to build in before product launch. I've seen a lot of folks be surprised by how long this can take and have to delay product launch until they get FCC certification, um, uh, and those that look at it early are not surprised. So TCBs won't certify devices that are, are doing things that nobody else has ever done or the FCC has never said how to deal with them, but they do the vast majority of these things. If you're successful, you get an FCC ID. Um, and uh, once you get the FCC ID, you're in good shape. But before you do, you can't import the devices, you can't market them, and you can't operate them in the United States. Um, uh, there are a few, F uh, few exceptions, uh, but generally assume that you can't use them. Next slide, please. So you've gotten your FCC ID, and now you have to do the annoying labeling and disclosure. So uh, uh, every radio that uh, ra every radio that's out there, intentional or un unintentional, has to know and comply with the FCC's labeling uh, uses. So and this is going to depend on the type of device and the method you use to win authorization. So I won't go through these in detail, but uh, you can look and see, depending on which one you chose, whether you uh, chose verification, declaration of conformity, or certification, you get different rules. Now, the ones that I've shown here are for Part 15 unlicensed devices. Note that the labeling rules are different depending on your device, and those medically specific bands have specific labeling and magic word uh, rules uh, uh, for each of those services. And so it's important to look to see what they are and make sure that your device has the right logos on the back. If you flip over your phone and look in the battery compartment or right on the back of your iPhone, you'll see the FCC logo and you'll see some European ones as well. Um, and in the uh, packaging and in the, in, in the um, uh, uh, user's manual, all of these are important to, to make sure you get right. So um, uh, note that the FCC's, uh, if you get FCC and European uh, labeling a disclosure right, that often helps in a lot of the other countries as well. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. So uh, finally, I'll just talk about the accessibility rules for a second. So the, uh, the FCC has had accessibility rules on the books for decades, um, but following the new Communications and Video Accessibility Act, it's greatly expanded the type and scope of the companies that are covered by these rules. And the FCC has become much more aggressive in the area. Uh, so companies should pay attention to these rules uh, in the M Health area. So um, uh, as I said, the CVAA creates a series of covered services. So there's interconnected VoIP, uh, and this is uh, uh, apart from the traditional ones that cover traditional telecommunication services. But now, interconnected VoIP, non-interconnected VoIP, uh, which just means that it's a uh, voice over Internet call that does not need to go to uh, every telephone number. Uh, so it can just be a closed group. Electronic messaging and interoperable video conferencing are all covered. So even if you don't have a uh, piece of equipment, but you're engaged in, in uh, a service that includes this, so a VoIP service that connects doctors and patients, um, uh, a video conferencing service that's interoperable, these things might give you FCC accessibility rules that you have to meet. So, and to do this, you have to make sure that the device is accessible to and usable by individuals with disabilities, um, unless doing so is not, quote, achievable, unquote. Uh, and uh, it must be done, in, uh, uh, it must be compatible with accessible equipment if it's not achievable. So you have to let people attach to your device. So as you can see, there are all kinds of specific rules here on input, control, mechanical features, and the FCC is going to take a look at performance objectives that are listed in, in the FCC rules as well. Enforcement here uh, includes the ability for consumers to complain about it, but also for the FCC to investigate it itself, and that's backstop with fines and mandated compliance. So uh, I'll stop there, uh, and thank you very much. The bottom line is that these FCC rules are considerable, uh, and they're important to mHealth investors, investors, and, and transacting parties. So getting them right puts you in an advantageous competitive position in the marketplace um, compared to people who might be getting them wrong. But getting them wrong can slow you down. It can, it can interrupt import, it can delay transactions, and it can even lead to fines or even worse, these injunctive actions that mean product redesign. But the FCC staff is terrific. They want the mHealth industry to thrive. It's very clear uh, so they can be flexible and helpful. And don't hesitate to drop me a line if you want to get into more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Next we have Adam Salander with Cybersecurity Considerations for the Wireless Health Fair. 
Adam? Great. Thank you so much. Um, moving on to the next slide right there. Um, thank you so much. So what I want to talk to you about today is going to sound somewhat familiar for those of us who have been in the healthcare space, but what I want to do is I want to talk about HIPAA in a little bit different construct. And I think that the media over the last few weeks has really shown us that anyone in the health or device space is now in a new era at which you know, I'm, I'm calling the data breach era, where we have to take extra precautions to make sure both our IP and the data that we collect and use for patients uh, is safe. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about mostly the security rule under HIPAA and how that fits into an mHealth space and some of the things that we've seen that can be risks in your environment uh, dealing with other mHealth companies and things to look out for. So moving to the next slide, there's sort of three buckets of regulation here. The first two are, are the old familiar HIPAA privacy and security rule. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the privacy rule. Uh, the privacy rule really focuses on you know, the information you collect, a patient's right to that information, who you're allowed to disclose that information to, and making sure you have the proper paperwork in place uh, in terms of business associate agreements, et cetera. Uh, the security rule is really what I want to focus on today, and I think it's most relevant uh, given what's happened uh, you know, to healthcare companies recently. And the security rule basically requires that you implement appropriate administrative, physical, and technical safeguards to ensure that the data that you're steward of is protected. So any sort of electronic health uh, uh, information, you want to make sure that you are appropriately protecting that using those three buckets, physical, administrative, and technical safeguards. Uh, I'm also including state law. So the way HIPAA was passed is HIPAA is a federal floor. So any state can enact a law that is more stringent than HIPAA. If they enact a law that's less stringent than HIPAA, that law would be preempted. But as a result, you know, states now, uh, we're seeing a lot more proposals given, you know, the prevalence of data breaches recently, but 47 states had at some point taken the opportunity to pass different laws governing, uh, use typically data breach, but also in certain cases, uh, the security of sensitive information. And these laws are a lot more broad in a lot of cases than what HIPAA uh, traditionally is and will sweep a lot of companies uh, under a HIPAA-like standard that previously would make arguments that they weren't subject to HIPAA. Uh, this is something that's evolving. It's something that we're going to have to, you know, take a, a long look at and monitor pretty closely. But moving on to the next slide. So essentially, there are two ways in which you can be subject to HIPAA. One is by law. So you can be a covered entity uh, or now a business associate. So if, you know, you're a provider, you're a healthcare clearinghouse, or you're an insurer, you're subject to HIPAA. If you are somebody who creates, maintains, or stores information on behalf of those covered entities, you are subject to HIPAA by virtue of the fact that you're a business associate of those people. Uh, there's another bucket that I think is most relevant uh, here to M Health companies is by contract. So by virtue of our clients, you know, the providers, the insurers, uh, whoever is using our devices, a lot of times they will push business associate agreements on us. So they will make us uh, covenant in contracts that we are subject to the privacy and security rule. Uh, this has always been one of these areas of contention. It's something that, as lawyers, we argue about on both sides of this uh, endlessly. You know, on the provider side, we say, hey, you know, you're, you're storing information on behalf of us. You have uh, access to the devices that, you know, we're using. Uh, you help us service it. You have access to the data. On the other side, the device companies have always said, hey, you know what, we're literally a device company. We're not, we're not storing this on your behalf. You know, you're using our systems. We're no different than, you know, a mobile phone carrier. That's always been a sticking point. And the way that this used to come out is the business associate agreements eventually would be passed with, you know, some language saying, you know, if applicable, if it's determined that we're subject to HIPAA, we'll comply with all this stuff. That used to make the providers happy, the insurers happy, and it also used to make the device companies happy. Uh, we're seeing this sort of uh, happy resolution come to an end. Uh, as data breaches are becoming more prevalent, as they're becoming more severe, as companies are facing, you know, uh, what could be death sentences in, in litigation due to privacy uh, and security breaches, uh, we're seeing uh, more of an adherence to uh, HIPAA no matter what. So even if you aren't, uh, you take the position you're not subject to HIPAA, now a lot of these providers, a lot of these insurers are saying, you know, we really don't care. You're going to sign the agreement and you're going to comply with it. 
So as you can see uh, by this very high-tech graphic, there's two ways, by law and by contract. You can also see that lawyers can't do math because there's a plus sign there. It should be or. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, this is really the new reality that's facing us as health and, and really device companies. The FBI issued this alert last summer, and they basically said that malicious actors, which are basically hackers, are going after the healthcare and they're going after the device industry. There's really two buckets here, and I think this FBI uh, warning last summer was really focusing on IT, uh, on IP. And, you know, hackers are going after your IP. They are trying to compromise your systems, your applications. They're trying to compromise your devices to steal that IP and sell that to other people. There's the other side, which is really what's been in the media recently, which is the data that these devices collect. And that is under attack as well as, you know, <laughs> anyone who's looked at, at the media recently. Uh, the problem for us in the health, especially in the health space, is that while other highly regulated industries, you know, the financial industries, you know, banking, DOD, military uh, industries, they have been under attack for years. Uh, in the healthcare industry, we're now just seeing this. Uh, the first specific hack that was reported of a healthcare industry uh, person really happened within the last few years. Uh, so it's something that's new to us. I think we're behind on it. But given the fact that health and device is such a technical field, I think there's a huge opportunity for us to catch up very quickly uh, using sort of multidisciplinary approaches uh, that are consistent with the HIPAA security rule. So moving on to the next slide, the security rule in the data breach age. The good news for all of us is that the security rule is compatible with solid IT practices. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, it requires that we implement appropriate administrative, physical, technical safeguards to protect our data. Uh, pr prior to, you know, the last few years, there used to be sort of two buckets of compliance here. There used to be the compliance people and the legal people who would do their HIPAA audits, they would look at HIPAA, and that would be totally detached from the oper operations wings of the company. So, you know, the product development, the IT, all of that would not really be a part of this HIPAA audit. I think with the sophistication of the tax coming around now, we're seeing that change. And where it used to be HIPAA compliance or it used to be security of your infrastructure or your device, those are now becoming one and the same. And the good news is that HIPAA provides us a common vehicle where we can sort of package these two things together. Uh, going back to the security rule, uh, you'll always hear, you know, things being HIPAA security rule compliant. That really is a misnomer. Uh, under the security rule, uh, there are some required uh, things that you have to do, but a majority of the security rule is non-articulated and really makes you look at what are the risks to your organization's data and put in appropriate safeguards to protect that data. So there's very few articulated controls. The controls that are out there are really process-driven to get you to the right result to protect that data. Moving on to the next page. So the whole foundation of the HIPAA security rule and what you need to do as a mobile device company is you need to conduct a risk assessment. It's the absolute most important thing you can do to protect your data, to protect your IP, and to show evidence of compliance uh, with HIPAA. So any business partners will always ask for your risk assessment. Any auditor from the government, the first thing that's always asked for is your risk assessment. So what does the security rule uh, tell us to do? It says that we have to conduct an accurate and thorough assessment of the vulnerabilities to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of our EPHI, so any electronic data. Uh, this is something that is supposed to be done over and over and over again. You're supposed to look at your vulnerabilities. After you look at your vulnerabilities, determine what they are, you're supposed to put in place mitigation plans, which is the second half of the regulation. So you assess your vulnerabilities and you put in plans to fix those vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, this is, again, uh, on my theme of this being a multidisciplinary approach, you know, this has to hit the physical, administrative, and technical piece. So you need to involve all aspects of the organization. You know, you need to do scanning. You need to, if you're a device company, bring in your product development people to do code review or, or a third-party person. You also need to look at the, within the four walls of your organization to make sure uh, everything is safe. Uh, a couple of practice tips here is this is going to be the most sensitive document you have in a HIPAA context. This is something that you don't necessarily want to show the world. Uh, the most important thing that I think that you can do here to protect yourself as you're looking at the vulnerabilities, so you're looking at the things that 
say our data is risk, at risk. And from a negligence standpoint uh, that plaintiff's attorneys will use, this is really the golden ticket to say, hey, you know, they knew that we weren't encrypting information. Uh, so it's something that you want to protect under attorney-client privilege. You know, involve your lawyers. Uh, it's also something that, you know, you don't want to boil the ocean. So who you choose as a vendor to conduct this risk assessment for you is extremely important. Uh, you want to look at the things uh, that impact uh, the, privacy, uh, the privacy and security of your data. You don't necessarily want to go on a witch hunt to find every possible thing that's wrong with your organization that then you are under a duty to fix or put in a plan to fix or else uh, uh, run afoul of that negligence standard. Moving on to the next slide. A couple of things that we see uh, sort of over and over and over again in the M Health space is uh, one of the things that will be picked up in your risk assessment is business partners. You know, the privacy rule requires that we push out business associate agreements to any downstream BA, so anyone who maintains, uh, creates, or stores information on our, on our behalf. This is often the weakest link in your IT security. Uh, you know, anytime somebody is going to, you know, do some coding for you, do some development, you know, handle data, uh, do any kind of analytics. You want to really approach uh, that business relationship now as if you're buying the company. You need to look at, you know, the security controls they have in place, you know, make sure they've done a risk assessment, and make sure that you're totally comfortable with that. Uh, an area that we see often in the M Health space is offshore partners. Uh, this becomes even more important. Because you have limited ability to, you know, audit somebody who may be in a foreign country, you may have, you know, communication barriers, you know, there certainly uh, could be an ocean between you, it's important that you really do your diligence. Uh, you know, you make sure that uh, you're comfortable with how they're handling information. And finally, making sure that your contracts have the appropriate indemnification and that if something happens, that business partner will be able to uh, reimburse you or, or at least start pay, uh, pay for some of the mitigation efforts. Moving on to the next slide, uh, the thing that keeps me up at night is employees. Uh, you know, HIPAA requires that we train our employees under the privacy rule, but as you've seen in the media recently, some of the most damaging breaches we've seen have been the result of social engineering, where, you know, people for some reason, uh, you know, fell, fell uh, prey to a scheme, gave up their username and password, and at that point, it doesn't matter what type of security controls you have in place. Those people have access to your systems. They can download whatever they want. Uh, that's the thing that keeps me up most at night. You know, being in a law firm, uh, it, it terrifies me. You know, uh, it, it really uh, is a clash of generations. You know, younger generations are certainly, uh, you know, more in tune to things, uh, you know, spoofing and, and con artists than, you know, maybe the older generations. So that's the challenge as organizations that we have is making sure that we're pushing out training where people look for those obvious attempts. Uh, to steal passwords and to steal your data. The other thing that you should always look for for employees is where they've set up different business processes using sensitive information that create what I call a hidden repository of sensitive data. You know, you're looking for a developer who's using live data uh, that may have social security numbers or financial information in it. Uh, you're looking for somebody in accounting who, you know, has their own system. You know, it's always Debbie has her own system. No one knows how it works. Well, that system is full uh, of data that, you know, may not be protected by your organization because you don't know it's there. Uh, so really, it's important that you look at, you know, what's available uh, out there uh, in terms of uh, your training, looking at what's available out there in your organization. I recently got a call from somebody uh, on, on one of these phishing exercises where they had obviously looked, in my, looked at my LinkedIn profile. They knew that I was linked into people who sell a specific software that could be used to communicate between computers. They had obviously looked at the law firm's organization chart and knew who was head of IT, called me from India saying that they're with our IT, that the head of our IT asked that they call, and he would like to connect to my computer using the software, which isn't on my computer. Moving on to the next. Um, so it's important that you do the risk assessment. It's important that you look at things like employees. It's important that, that you know, you look at business partners, but it's also important that you know what to do if you have a breach. Uh, it's not if, it's when you're going to have a breach. And in a breach, literally every minute uh, counts. Uh, oftentimes, uh, data breach is about half of my practice and ever increasing. Uh, the most frustrating thing to me is, you know, organization experiences a breach, and then they can't get the people on site to, you know, do the forensics because they're in the contract negotiation. Uh, you know, another situation we see all the time is IT discovers a breach, you know, they spend a week or so, you know, looking at it and then realize it's a big deal. 
uh, you have to have that protocol in place to respond uh, quickly and respond effectively in order to mitigate that breach in a reasonable amount of time. So moving on to the next slide, I'm actually going to skip over one here. Uh, really my takeaways, if you can go to the next slide, my takeaways are because state law and because, uh, you know, state law created a federal, uh, creates, you know, an additional layer of regulation, you're going to be subject in most cases to HIPAA or similar state law. Uh, as an industry, both device and health, you know, we are uh, under attack. We have the same sensitive data that, you know, more regulated industries that are ahead of us, you know, defense and finance have. So we're a great target. Uh, and the final takeaway is that compliance, legal, and IT need to work together in order to come up with a situation where we're assessing our risk and we're putting in appropriate measures to protect ourselves. Uh, that's all I have, so I will turn it back to you, Jared. Thanks, Adam. And lastly, um, we have Adrian Fowler, Beyond HIPAA, the Evolving Landscape for Privacy Regulation. Adrian? Thanks, Jaren. Um, Adam already touched on, uh, on HIPAA rules and what to do in the event of breach. But even if HIPAA, apply, does, even if HIPAA applies to the product and service you're working on and you never experience a data breach, you still need to think about privacy and data security principles outside of HIPAA and government regulators who enforce other laws. Like Paul, I'm going to keep my um, presentation at a relatively high level, um, both because of time constraints and, uh, and interest levels, but I'm more than happy to, to speak with folks after the presentation or during the Q&A time um, about any of these issues in more detail. Um, so Kim talks a lot about FDA regulation of, um, of mHealth devices. And DHS um, combined with DOJ are responsible for enforcing um, the federal HIPAA. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, the FTC and, and DOJ, um, the, which is the Federal Trade Commission, um, and also the Federal Communication Commission, and state attorneys general, and the role of these three groups um, in enforcing uh, privacy and data security principles um, against entities of all sorts, um, and M M health entities in particular. So, M health privacy and data security often lies in the overlap among numerous regulators' jurisdiction. I come from a government enforcement background um, at DOJ, and I do some enforcement work here at um, Harris, Wilcher, and Granite. So, I want to focus on uh, these other domestic regulators um, that you'll want to think about as you are designing your product, considering investing in a company, or considering acquiring a company that has um, mHealth um, and data assets. So let's start with the most active federal privacy regulator, which is the FTC. Um, moving on to the next slide. The Federal Trade Commission, um, I'm not sure how many of you folks have had any interaction with the Federal Trade Commission, um, but they regulate almost everyone. Um, the FCC has jurisdiction over persons, partnerships, or co corporations. There are a few big exceptions. They, can't, they don't have jurisdiction over certain uh, financial institution and common carriers, um, but for the most part, they have jurisdiction over more or less everyone else. Um, they, under the Federal Trade Commission Act, they have the, um, the power and the duty to prohibit unfair acts and practices um, in commerce in the United States. That may sound like a really broad mandate, because it is. Um, and as a part of this mandate, the FTC has determined that certain acts with respect to um, to privacy and data security can constitute unfair acts or practices that violate the Federal Trade Commission Act. One important note for, uh, for mHealth in particular is that um, the FTC has publicly taken the position that HIPAA's rules about privacy and data security do not preempt um, the FTC's rules about privacy and data security. So even if you comply with the, the HIPAA rules and all the state rules that, um, that Adam was just talking about, you still need to look at, um, at FTC jurisprudence 
in the area of privacy and data security. Also, state attorneys generals um, often, uh, well, states have often passed what are known as little FTC acts that also outlaw unfair and deceptive acts and practices that incur within the state. Um, and state attorneys general have often interpreted those state little FTC acts to cover, to cover similar privacy and data security um, measures as the Federal Trade Commission. So um, before we turn to what exactly the, the, um, the FTC regulates, um, let's talk about, uh, talk for a moment what, about what the FTC and state attorneys generals can do to a company with deficient privacy and data security practices. Um, the, the kind of big kahuna in the room are um, FTC consent decrees. Um, the FTC, a violation of the FTC Act can um, lead to injunctive relief um, on behalf of the FTC. And the FTC has taken a, a pretty aggressive position with respect to its consent decrees, oftentimes requiring comprehensive privacy programs and ongoing monitor, monitoring, oftentimes for up to 20 years by the FTC of those compliance programs. Another thing that the FTC and the state attorneys generals can often go after is consumer redress. Under certain cases, um, there can be statutory fines. Um, and oftentimes, there are state private rights of action associated with the, the little FTC Act um, that you need to worry about in terms of private liability. Moving on to the next slide. So what is the FTC Act and you know, the analogous little FTC Acts commonly? What do they cover in terms of privacy? First, it, the types of information that are protected under the FTC Act are broader than the types of information that are covered under HIPAA. Um, the FTC Act uh, principles with respect to privacy and data security covers PII, personally identifiable information. Um, there's no, uh, there are no um, regulations in the CFR <laughs> dealing with um, the FTC's regulation of privacy and data security. It all comes out of, um, out of FTC enforcement actions. And uh, what counts as PII is not terribly well defined, but it's safe to say that um, any non-anonymous -ident identifier, such as somebody's name, their social security, their IP address, um, their MAC address, um, and any information that's linked back to that identifier uh, counts as PII, um, and treatment of that information that is unfair or deceptive can violate the FTC Act or a state analog. So the, the specifics of what PII you can collect, what you can do with PII, and how secure it, um, it has to be can vary according to the, to the circumstances. The FTC has taken a case-by-case -case approach to enforcement of its privacy and cybersecurity principles. Um, as I mentioned, the FTC Act outlaws unfair and deceptive practices. Deceptive practices de generally deal with the, the big picture question of, are you following your own privacy and data security promises? not just in your privacy policy, but also in your advertisements and any, and any communication to consumers or your customers um, about what that, that could impact your privacy practice, privacy and data security practices. Um, you can't make affirmative misrepresentations. You can't flat out lie. Intent is irrelevant. So if something later changes that makes your privacy practices um, no longer true, uh, and you don't change those privacy practices, um, even if you didn't mean to violate folks' privacy or lie, privacy or lie about your privacy policies, um, that change, the, the new practice can violate the FTC Act as a deceptive practice. Um, it's not just flat out lies. The FTC also covers implied misrepresentations. Um, it has this concept also of context to the growing area of, um, of concern for the FTC. Basic concept here is that what a consumer expects you to use their data or to do to their data um, based on the transaction that you have with them. Are you collecting their data as a part of um, 
of an app where you're providing a certain service to them. They, the consumer probably expects you to do the things necessary to provide that service. They may not expect you to then sell their information to a third-party marketer. Um, so as a part of what you, what you should disclose, if you disclose one thing and leave something else out, it's possible that, that the FTC may find um, you've made an implied misrepresentation. Um, and also, if you very prominently say one thing about your privacy practice and then hide something else entirely, you know, halfway through a long legal policy, um, the FTC may find that that's an insufficient um, disclosure, especially if the, the, the hidden provision contradicts a very prominent provision about your privacy practices. Um, I'm not going to talk much about international law here. Um, it's also, but for folks who are regulated, who are, or for folks who um, have data from EU countries, uh, safe harbor compliance is also, um, if you say you are compli compliant with safe harbor and then do not, that can also be um, prosecuted as a violation of the FTC Act. Um, and there are certain ca categories of practices that are unfair. Um, retroactively changing treatment of data already collected without first getting consumer consent, um, failure to maintain reasonable and adequate data security, and use of data inconsistent with context. That one, the FTC hasn't taken much, enforce, much if any, enforcement action on as an unfair practice, um, but they are heavily relying on, on it in their guidance document, so it's something to watch out for going forward. Um, next slide, please. So as mHealth innovators and investors, uh, what should you look out for? First of all, um, the FTC has made clear in recent reports that it views data security as including um, the responsibility to have reasonable and adequate data security to include control over device functionality. The FTC is worried about um, a hacker hacking somebody's pacemaker. Um, and uh, other, but you know, not and also not as dramatic examples of a hacker taking over M health devices um, and technology, and so that needs to be a part of uh, of your overall cybersecurity um, analysis and design um, that Adam talked about in more detail. Additionally, um, even if you're not a business entity or covered by a HIPAA um, contract, um, one uh, another. I don't, you also have to work out, look out for subcontractors, even if you're outside of that context. Um, you should make sure that your subcontractors and affiliates who get access to your PII also are similarly limited in their use of the use of that PII and their security of that PII, so that it's consistent with your policies and your representations to consumers. Um, otherwise, you can be held liable for a subcontractor's failure. Um, and in addition, um, in acquiring, in terms of valuing PII, you should look at what promises have been made. I mean, if you're looking to acquire a company and they've severely limited um, how they how their they will use PII, an acquiring company will be bound by those promises. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, moving moving along. So one thing to keep in mind that uh, I had planned on doing a little bit deeper of a delve on, but, but I'll um, just give a two-second overview, um, is COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. And as mHealth innovators, um, in many instances, you may know the age of the people who are using your product. Um, if you know the age of the person using your product or service, and you allow users under the age of 13, um, there will likely be special rules that apply to you. Um, CABA imposes a, a series of enhanced obligations about limits on data collection, data use, um, data security, um, and it's something to watch out for, particularly in the mHealth space. A lot of people mistakenly believe that CABA only applies to websites. That's simply not true. If you have an mHealth device or um, an mHealth product or essentially any online service, which is any, basically anything that connects to the Internet, 
um, and you knowingly collect um, personal information from minors under the age of 13, um, then you are covered by COPPA and need to comply with it. We can move along two slides forward, please. Um, and uh, Adam covered State Attorney's general role in data breach notification, so I won't go into that. But it's worth noting that um, State Attorney's generals, in addition to late uh, little FTCX, may have more specific legislation on privacy. Um, watch out if you're collecting Social Security number um, uh, in, in particular, um, or if any component of your software or product could be reasonably interpreted as akin to spyware. Um, there are also uh, some states require um, more disclosures in part of in your privacy practices um, and privacy notices. Um, moving along, the last regulator that I want to talk about is the Federal Communications Commission. Historically, it hasn't taken a huge role in privacy regulation. Most prominently, it um, has imposed a series of rules on a very limited category of data called CPNI, which is Customer Proprietary Network Information, that's collected by telecommunications providers and interconnected VoIP providers. Um, with the Title II reclassification that Paul mentioned, the, the new net neutrality rules, exactly who the CPNI rules apply to um, is likely going to change. It's probably going to apply to, um, to Internet service providers, um, and we will see if it, it applies to anyone else. Um, and, uh, and to the extent that you have an interconnected VoIP component of your mHealth service or device, um, it's worth talking to a lawyer about whether you're required to comply with the CPNI rules and how. We, here at HWG, we commonly counsel um, clients on such things. Um, and moving to the last slide, it's simply worth noting that the Federal Communications Commission is expanding its reach in privacy regulation, um, both with Title II reclassification um, and applying the CPNI rules to, um, to more companies, um, but also expanding its reach of privacy regulation beyond things that, that count as CPNI. There's been a recent, there was a recent notice of apparent liability for forfeiture um, against two companies, Yortel America and Terracom, that indicate that the FCC wants to um, regulate more informa information that does not um, count as CPNI, so wants to regulate things that are more akin to PII, um, which is, uh, as we talked about earlier, and um, also that it may take a broader approach to security regulation as well, um, and that, that the space is evolving and M health, regu M health companies simply need to keep a, a very close watch on future development within the FCC. Um, and with that, I'll wrap up. Wonderful. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you to all of the panelists. This was a really excellent, excellent presentation or series of presentations. Um, with that, we are now at the hour. I will encourage those that are still on the line, if they're interested in participating in Q&A, to remain on the line for a few minutes more. We had one question come in, actually two questions. One is uh, really for Whitney. Will the slides be made available? I believe they will be, but Whitney, you might want to address that. Yes. In two to three business days, I will send an email to all registrants that includes the slides and a recording of today's presentation. Wonderful. And the second question that had come in is, I think, really directed towards Kim. Is a hub tablet phone considered a medical device accessory if connected to an FDA device, uh, presumably an FDA-listed, uh, um, cleared, or approved device, such as a thermometer or a blood pressure cuff monitor? Kim? Right. So, so there, there, you're really going to need to look at what is the device doing? Um, what is, is it simply, you know, what's the functionality of the product? Is it merely displaying data, uh, storing the data, or, you know, transmitting the data? Um, in this instance, it sounds like it may be displaying the data, if I'm understanding the, the use case scenario well. Um, 
And there, it, it, if it's just merely displaying it, it will probably fall within that MDDS classification. Um, but you need to, again, the, the key question is going to be what is it doing with the data? Because if it's um, doing any kind of analysis, a modification, or processing of the data, manipulating the data, um, or converting it, you know, it, beyond some simple language translation, um, it, it would fall outside of MDDS and may be separately regulated. Um, and it, whether it's considered an accessory, you're going to have to go back through sort of the accessory guidance in terms of um, is it supplementing the device? Um, if it's serving as a secondary display, as an example, for the device data, it's likely considered an accessory. Um, but under the draft guidance, what you'd be looking at is the functionality in and of itself and not automatically upregulating to the, to the primary device. So, um, you know, you're going to be, you know, there's a bit of patchwork when you look at some of these issues looking at each one of the different guidance documents. But my sense is, is that um, purely just displaying, it'd probably fall within that MDDS category and, and be subject to enforcement discretion. Kim, as a follow-up, and I actually uh, I also want to state, if uh, those uh, that are still on the line are interested in posing a question, please use your chat box to do so. Um, Kim, as a follow-up question, another attendee is asking uh, whether a telemedicine software allowing a doctor to remotely view the results of various medical device measurements in order to allow the remote doctor to provide medical advice to the remote patient, would that be FDA regulated? And that's similar analysis, um, and what I would what I would um, highlight here is, is the, when folks talk about remote monitoring, you know, there's a whole, there's a fairly broad body of regulation today regarding remote, remote monitoring. Um, so the, you'd need to take a look at those classifications and some of those products and see how it compares. Um, from a, if we're talking about a, a virtual visit type scenario where you're just displaying the medical device data. It's going to be a very similar analysis to what I walked, just walked through, um, but I would highlight in addition to whether it's modifying the data or processing the data, is the use case, um, the intended use case, is it involving a situation where the physician uh, needs to be actively monitoring that patient remotely and is relying upon the data to make, you know, the term of art is immediate clinical decisions. So you're going to need to look at the use case scenario as well to make sure that, um, to determine whether it's, it falls outside of that MDDS definition. Great. Thanks, Kim. Um, another question, this one for Adrian, uh, potentially uh, also Adam. Um, there's been a lot of action recently uh, with FTC, literally over the past week, uh, in the FTC enforcing uh, the law over some uh, mobile health apps, um, specifically some dermatology apps. Um, has the FTC indicated that it is particularly concerned about the privacy and cybersecurity implications of mHealth technologies, Adrian? Yes, they have. Um, uh, in particular, they've indicated that um, in a recent Internet of Things report um, and also in follow-up uh, presentations by the Federal Trade Commission on the Internet of Things. Um, they indicated that they're particularly interested in, um, in the privacy and data security implications of mHealth devices that connect to, um, that, are, that are Internet enabled, um, but also opined that, um, that just health, healthcare generally um, and healthcare information um, is particularly valuable to identity thieves um, and that, uh, that because of, um, of that focus uh, of, of uh, identity thieves, the FTC really wants to encourage companies to let consumers know what data is being collected so they can make informed choices about whether to, how much data to provide to, um, to M Health companies and to apps. Um, and, and whatnot, um, but also for companies to limit the amount of data that they collect in order to, um, to reduce the, the cybersecurity um, risks associated with collecting information um, through an mHealth devi device. So while FTC, I believe, recognizes that you have to collect 
a, a lot of information in order to have a good mHealth app or service or device, um, the FTC is actively encouraging companies um, to make it as limited as possible um, and then obviously take steps to, um, to ensure that, uh, that that data is as protected as possible. It views, as I mentioned in my presentation, the FTC views what, um, what is not deceptive or what is not unfair um, under the circumstances. Um, and one of the ways it evaluates, evaluates the fairness of, um, of data security practices is by the sensitivity of the information collected. And it views um, health information in particular as, um, as extremely sensitive and warranting the highest degree of cybersecurity protection possible. Um, so uh, both in its recent enforcement actions and in its guidance documents, as well as its public statements, the FTC uh, is, is taking a very active approach to, um, to personally identifiable information related to health. Thanks, Adrian. That's a great segue to, to Adam. Adam, uh, the FDA doesn't really regulate health data, um, but they have issued guidance on cybersecurity. What is FDA's role in cybersecurity? And that's still to be determined. Um, you know, certainly there, there is uh, a uh, a division of duties between typical HIPAA-covered entities and the FDA, uh, given the fact that a lot of you know, device companies and uh, entities that were typically regulated by the FDA uh, were falling outside of the jurisdiction of HIPAA, uh, I think the FDA stepped in and is starting to develop that, that body of regulation. Um, where their ultimate role, and I think this is a conversation that also uh, rolls into the FTC, uh, where their ultimate role uh, plays out, where the FTC's ultimate uh, role plays out uh, in the protection of health data, uh, in addition to state law, is something that's still in flux. Uh, when you see a lot of, there's a lot of legislation that is being uh, passed right now uh, that's looking to maybe standardize the protection of health data a little bit more. Uh, but until that point, you know, it's difficult to say what their role is. Uh, the regulation on the FDA side certainly is, does not have the level of articulation of HIPAA or even really the FTC at, at this point. So it's difficult to see uh, where it comes out, but I, I certainly think that the regulation that has been released so far is evidence that they'll continue regulating uh, health data. Thank you, Adam. And Paul, uh, very lastly, uh, you mentioned a number of different equipment processes, applications, and rules. Um, how does the FCC enforce the rules that you were discussing? Well, it, there are a couple different ways. One is on the front end through the equipment authorization process. And so before you can market a device or import a device or use the device, you have to get this FCC ID. And so the first way they do it is through this, this um, kind of prophylactic FCC ID requirement. And you do that through most likely the, the TCB labs that have been deputized by the FCC to, um, uh, to test for all these rules. And so once you get that FCC ID, that's a uh, type certification saying, I promise that all my future devices will be just as good as the one that was tested. So that's the first way. Then the FCC has an enforcement bureau and uh, enforcement bureau field offices that uh, uh, look for violations. And the minority of time this happens because uh, somebody with a spectrum analyzer and, a, and, a, and a, an FCC uh, jacket is walking around trying to find your violations, but most of the time it's because you interfere with somebody or because one of your competitors turns you in. They see, you know, the competitor says, you know, how is it that Acme Tech is able to get 25% better uh, throughput than me? And they look at your device and they see that you're above the power levels or using an emission mask that's a little different or you've got uh, some, some, something else. Or they see that you're marketing a device that doesn't fit squarely within the FCC's use rules. And then they quietly call the FCC and, um, and, and turn you in. And then you'll get a, um, a letter of inquiry from the FCC or a call from an FCC field office or um, something along that lines. And, and when that happens, you're going to want to talk to your lawyer pretty quickly to figure out how to, how to respond to it. And so, uh, or you, you get your neighbor, your spectral neighbor, who says, 
I'm getting interference from some source, and they, they figure out that that source is you, and then they go to the FCC, or they come directly to you. Um, uh, in that second case where it's not your competitor, it's more likely that they'll come to you and say, uh, turn down your device or, or point it in a different direction or something like that. Um, uh, and you can, you can deal with it without coming to the FCC. But once the FCC gets involved, it goes to the FCC's Enforcement Bureau, and then it becomes a more formalized process to uh, look to see whether you need to pay a fine, uh, whether you need to turn the devices off, um, or in severe cases, whether a consumer device doesn't, buy, doesn't meet the rule and they'll rescind um, an FCC certification, which means you can no longer import it. Great, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Whitney, um, can you come up to the presenter slide? It's a few slides up. While Whitney is doing that, uh, I'd like to, uh, to thank everyone that has attended today's webinar. Um, you have everyone's contact information before you. I encourage if you have any legal questions or specific questions to please reach out to our panelists. Uh, they'd be more than happy to help you. I'd also like to thank the firms of Epstein, Becker, Green. Uh, it's a national law firm with a primary focus on healthcare and life sciences. Also, Harris, Wilshire, and Granis, a boutique law firm with one of the leading telecommunications and technology practices in the U.S. And with that, I'd like to thank our host, Whitney. And Whitney, I'm sending it back to you. Great, and thank you for being such a wonderful moderator today, Robert. Thank you, everyone, thank you. for joining us. This concludes today's webinar, and approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green and Harris Wiltshire Granite will communicate the availability of the webinar recording and access to the PowerPoint material. Thank you.